Welcome to Real Talk, Real Estate Discussions with Andrew Kirsch. In each episode, Andrew interviews industry leaders. We'll hear their real-time opinions on today's market, their background and unique career highlights, and guidance for newcomers into the industry. You can find this show at skalalkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Now here's the host of Real Talk, Andrew Kirsch. Episode 21 of Real Talk. This week, we have Moses Kagan, founder of Adaptive Realty. Moses, also uh, known in the Twitterverse uh, of being the unofficial chair uh, or czar of real estate Twitter with over 100,000 followers. Uh, Moses shares a very candid and interesting perspective on the multifamily business focusing uh, in Los Angeles. In addition to owning real estate, Moses runs a third-party property management company. In addition, he runs uh, a very successful real estate conference, an unconference, he calls it. Reconvene is the formal name of the conference, which will take place in September of this year in Santa Monica. Also, uh, if that's not enough, he has a new business where he is helping emerging managers raise LP capital. So through all of this, from ownership to management to his conference uh, um, hosting and now raising money for sponsors, I trust that you will find this conversation that I recently had with Moses to be interesting. Uh, Thank you for listening. Hello. Welcome to another edition of Real Talk. I'm here with my good friend, client, fellow YPOer, Moses Kagan. Moses, how you doing? Very well. Thank you for having me, Andrew. And that is a really classy intro that you have. Well, you know, it's all because of who I've got doing the voiceover. And that's my my secret weapon. I cannot reveal her identity. She she has to remain anonymous. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Otherwise, she would be booked up with voiceover gigs all over Hollywood. <laughs> um, so Moses, uh, CEO, founder of Adaptive Realty, for my audience of all of, you know, two or three people, maybe, you know, your parents and wife and my wife and kids, uh, tell us what is Adaptive Realty? Yeah. So uh, uh, my partner, John, and I have been buying and renovating apartment buildings in Los Angeles since 2008. Started Adaptive in uh, 2012. Currently own $220 million uh, worth of apartment buildings here in L.A., And uh, alongside that, we've also built a property management company uh, through which we manage about a thousand units, uh, half of which are ours and half of which are owned by a relatively small number of third party owners um, who uh, trust us to uh, to take care of them. Got it. So so you're focused geographically uh, L.A. I mean, is it specifically city of L.A. or really just like the L.A. County, greater Southern California area? The stuff that we own is actually all in the city of Los Angeles um, for for various reasons. Um, we manage some stuff in Santa Monica, uh, but it's but it's it's principally city of LA. Well, then let's dive into one of the more I guess con- well we could talk about many controversial issues <laughs> with the city of LA, uh, <laughs> but the most recent one, and I've talked about it on my podcast the last few weeks, and it's really been the focus of attention uh, across all my clients, whether it's private equity, lenders, owner operators, high net worth people, mom and pops, and that's the transfer tax and and, and ULA. And it's now in effect. I mean, we're now two, three weeks in, and there was a flurry of activity in March of of this past year, uh, almost like the, it was almost like a year end for me. Uh, March 31st was like a year end where we had a flurry of deals that had to close March 31st. what are your thoughts? I mean, are you concerned about how this is going to affect LA? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to say anything that your that that your other friends have have not already been telling you, but um, you know, it's it's disastrous public policy. I mean, we're we are um, permanent holders. That's an unusual thing about our business model. So we we have historically bought and and fixed up and held and recently sort of bought more like core stuff and for the purpose of indefinite holds. So it doesn't impact our business model directly. Um, that being said, I mean, I, again, I think it's an absolute disaster for the city and, and for the following reason, we have a major housing shortage. Um, a large portion of the new units that are delivered to the market every year are built by merchant builders. 
Uh, we have bought probably four buildings from, from people like that over the last couple of years. And ULA just makes that business much less profitable. And therefore, I mean, it's not, again, this is like, this isn't rocket science. Like these people are, they're rational actors. And even if they uh, themselves wanted to uh, uh, act irrationally, their capital providers will, you know, the, 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 the high net worths and institutions that write the checks and the banks, like, like it's pretty obvious, like the, you know, rents basically need to go up a lot to counteract the, uh, the effect of the tax on those pro formas. And so a lot of stuff's not going to get built. And um, it's just, I guess the last thing I'll say is I really feel like it was a, a major, I don't know if you want to call it an own goal, um, but I feel like many people in city council, or city government who are usually a little bit more attuned to these issues kind of took their eye off the ball on this one. And, uh, and I think with disastrous long-term results for the city. Yeah. And, and look, the, the equity groups that I'm talking to, um, I mean, they literally have told me that as of April 1, they put a red line through LA. They will not transact in LA. L uh, many lenders will not transact in LA, or at least their loan proceeds will be significantly reduced. It's still unclear as to whether this ULA law would impose the new transfer tax on a foreclosure and also when a lender then sells the real estate. So that's a an 11% hit. That's a huge number. I didn't even, you know, honestly, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't even thought about that. I mean, what a disaster. Yeah. So uh, lenders are thinking about that. So that would reduce loan proceeds by at least 11%. And it, it just creates just more friction in a time where you want people to do more business in your community. So, yeah. but it doesn't seem to affect your business, right? It, of, of, of long-term holds, or do you think it will in the, in the next, you know? Well, I mean, look, I think the, <laughs> um, the most important impact is going to be less supply and therefore higher rents. I mean, I, you know, this is, I, it's, it's weird that this is even controversial. It's like, uh, people have sort of agreed that supply and demand, um, uh, is affects every other thing that we that we buy and sell, and then there are these people who, for reasons of I don't know, either low IQ or or, or motivated reasoning, uh, have decided that, that supply and demand does not apply to apartments, but supply and demand applies to apartments. Like <laughs> I prefer to own stuff in places where people are not building more because I can charge more rent for it. <laughs> so, so as a long-term holder, I'm like, look, like you're going to, you're going to constrain supply growth. That means rents are going to grow faster. I mean, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you know, in my personal opinion, just talking about it, I think it's arrogance. And I think it's arrogance in that we are, or not we, but govern local government is assuming that because other than the fact the last several months, we've had the worst winter, but over the last however many hundreds of years, LA, Southern California has had you know the best weather in the United States, the entertainment industry and other industries that people will always come to LA, they'll always live in LA, they'll do business in LA. I think COVID, if you believe in the stats, and I, I do, I believe in the facts and I see where my clients are transacting, people are moving out of California, out of Southern California. And that this gives another reason for business to not do, um, do business in, Cal in, yeah. in L.A. And I don't think our local government officials truly believe it. And they feel like L.A. is in such hot demand all the time that this transfer tax will not chill any of this commerce and that they want a piece of, of the activity that's been going on. Look, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's just like, uh, obviously, that's just wrong. <laughs> and, and I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's also important to see ULA in, in the broader context. It has become much harder to do anything in, in LA over the last couple of years. I mean, I've renovated more than 100 apartment buildings here uh, starting in 2008. Um, everything has got harder. It's got um, plan check is harder. The inspectors are more painful. We haven't even talked about DWP and the disasters that they're causing for, for developers across the spectrum from people trying to build like a little ADU in their backyard uh, all the way up to, you know, uh, 100, 200 unit buildings in K-Town and other places where, you know, you can't get, a, get, get utility hookups and therefore people have basically fully constructed buildings sitting, you know, 
paying full whack on their construction loans and they can't move people in because they can't get utility hookups. I mean, it's just, so, so it's not, uh, and, and, and by the way, also uh, for those reasons and other reasons, construction prices have gone up by an unbelievable amount. I mean, it costs us twice as much to renovate an apartment now as it did six or seven years ago. And so you, you, you can't view ULA in isolation. It's ULA is going to kill a lot of merchant builders, but they were already under a lot of stress from all this other stuff too. And understandably, a lot of them are like, look, I can, there's people just, there's a lot of demand in Florida. There's a lot of demand in Texas and it's easy to do business in those places. And I'm just going to go build there. And, you know, development is not, I think people sometimes misunderstand, like, yes, there's an element of that where's money, you know, but there's also a ton of institutional knowledge. What, how does the zoning work? Who's the right contractor to use? Who's the banker to call? How do you underwrite the rent? That's institutional knowledge that's like not easy to replicate. And it's not easy to replace it when it just throws up its hands and says, I'm going to go build in Austin. And that's what we're losing right now is a whole generation of mid-career builders who, who are frankly have had enough. Yeah. Well, if we're one data point, I mean, we, I don't know, in 21, I think transacted around five or $6 billion of real estate in 22, a similar number, 23 will be a lot lower number, but at least two thirds of my deals are outside of California. So, but you seem to be taking a counter cyclical or counter um, account, a counterintuitive approach and staying in LA, despite the headwinds you talked about, the challenges, the regulatory framework, ULA and everything else. So for your short and medium and long-term business outlook, is it still going to be owned and operate in the city of LA? Good question. So we're going to own this. We're going to own and operate the stuff that we own. And we're happy to keep, um, we're happy to keep managing the stuff we own and managing for other people. Um, I suspect that we will continue to buy new construction deals when we can, where the numbers make sense, the way that we have the last couple of years. We like those in part because, uh, A, because it's so hard to build them. It's like, you know, uh, and it's so hard to renovate older buildings that actually sometimes buying new ones is like, even though the cap rates are low, kind of makes sense. Uh, another thing to say is that's one way to at least um, feel at least somewhat confident that the city council is not going to slap horrific rent control on you, right? Because you're you're sort of protected for the first 15 years or so. Um, so that's... Uh, uh, so, so that's, so that's kind of what we're doing here, but like, I'm not interested in buying any more rent stabilized stuff in part because of what's, um, what, how the city council has treated RSO owners over the last three, four years. Maybe we can talk about that. Um, so we're here, we're not going anywhere. We like our prop 13 basis. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to own the stuff, but we're definitely going to grow. Uh, we're, we're definitely focusing, um, our efforts on, other kinds of growth, whether it's other asset classes in Southern California, or, and we can talk about this, um, a new business, which I've uh, uh, re recently launched with some partners, which is intended to be nationwide. That's great. All right, so a, a few things to unpack. So one, you, you're assuming Prop 13 is going to stay. Um, and so you're the type of owner where it could really affect uh, when you have legacy assets, if it was brought up to market. Yeah, yeah. If Prop 13 goes, uh, then all bets are off. Like at that point, I think um, I think you get a lot more uh, open to selling stuff and just moving the capital to a more business friendly jurisdiction. I mean, it's not. It's just what's going on is that we, you know, we we've renovated a lot of buildings and we've owned them for a long time and we have really good basis in them. So they're they're sort of super. The 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 cash flow generation is super normal, let's say. Um, but if that goes away, yeah, like I, you know, I, I mean, I love living here and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things about it, but uh, it's an incredibly unfriendly environment in which to conduct business. So you you mentioned that you do a lot of rehab. You also buy from merchant builders. Do you do any ground up development? Not in any scale. Like we've bought, we've built a lot of ADUs. Uh, okay. We've built a couple of tiny, tiny ground up projects. And, you know, there are circumstances where I could imagine us building here, but um, it, the, the numbers are so far from working right now that, uh, it, it certainly is not going to happen in the foreseeable future. So of your, um, portfolio, what's your average, uh, unit count on, on deals that you buy? Tiny. So we, we own, um, we own 
500 units ish and we all uh, it, uh, spread across 50 ish buildings. Oh, wow. Okay. So our, our business is works like this. Like we realized at a certain point that you could earn really, really good returns renovating older uh, rent control buildings. So um, the, and the, the problem was that you, 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 these, you could get the really good returns on small buildings. Okay. Uh, the, the opportunities were just not available in larger buildings. Like the, the market for those was more efficient. So we created an organization that allowed us to buy and renovate 10, sometimes 20 of those smaller buildings at a time. So for like 10 years, we bought a building either ourselves or, or we did a bunch of fee development too, um, where we helped other people buy and renovate buildings. But we were, we were buying something every six to eight weeks for 10 years. So we just built a, it's a very unusual organization that we've built. It's one that can do, a, can put out, you know, in good times, reasonably large amounts of capital, but, but, um, but spread across a bunch of smaller projects. Sure. And do you feel like, um, so the, the analysis of, of owning a lot of smaller buildings, you can just generate a much higher return than owning fewer buildings, but larger, larger unit count. Yeah. I mean, um, this was a, this was, look, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not doctrinaire about this. Like we were just looking at the numbers and uh, however you want to think about it on a price per pound, like it was just cheaper to buy small buildings. And um, another thing to say is that larger buildings in Los Angeles um, have tended to be constructed from the sixties onwards. And those buildings were laid out more efficiently. In other words, there was less alpha to be generated by reconfiguring uh, the units in 60s buildings than there was in 20s buildings. So we basically, so, so your larger buildings tended to be ones where there wasn't as much uh, value for us to ring out. Sure. And what's an example of a 1920s style LA building? I don't know if it's bungalow style or, or what, where you feel like, the alpha that you can create is much more significant. I, not, I don't want you to give the secret sauce, but I don't know if there's any secret sauce in real estate, especially you, your prolific Twitter uh, poster. So you're, you're giving all your secrets anyway to, to your millions of followers. Maybe, well, I don't know about millions, <laughs> uh, but um, I look, um, uh, there is some secret sauce, but I can say, look, we, we add bedrooms. Um, we have in certain cases been able within the existing square footage to add units um, we obviously we build ADUs and, and with like, if you imagine a large building, right. Um, that's typically not going to have a lot of empty space, but right. if you imagine a 19, like your standard, uh, LA 1920s fourplex is, you know, two up, two down fourplex. There's typically like a large parking area in the back and you can build, a, you can build two units in the back there. And that's accretive usually. So it's, we sort of have developed like a bag of tricks um, for how to ring. Uh, we look at every deal, uh, every rehab deal anyway, uh, on an unlevered yield on cost basis. So it's really just about maximizing the unlevered yield on cost. And, um, and so we just have like a long list of tricks, let's call them moves or whatever, a playbook. Uh, that we employ and not every play in the playbook is um, relevant to every building, but uh, my partner and I can walk into a, pretty much any apartment building in Los Angeles and we can sort of like look at each other as we're walking the units and I can tell what he's thinking and he can think, he can tell what I'm thinking about what we're going to do to the units. Because like I said, we renovated more than a hundred of these things. And so like at a certain point, you've almost like seen every layout and you're like, oh, we're going to do a Clinton to this and a Bellevue to that. And, and we, and, and, and we can both walk out of the building without having said anything, meet, in the, meet on the sidewalk out front and know what we're going to do to the building. No, that's a great partner to have. You could read each other's minds. Um, and so talk about your, um, uh, I guess your capital and, and, and the equity that, that you have and uh, 220 some odd million dollars of, of real estate. I assume you're you're capitalizing each new acquisition with a, with a new syndication or do you have a fund? Uh, it's been, it's been a mix over time. A okay. couple um, things to say. One is um, we are, as I said before, indefinite holders. And what that means is I have literally never quoted an IRR to any, to any investor ever on any deal. And the reason is like, 
first of all, I'm not going to forecast an exit because we're not going to sell. And second of all, how the hell do I know what rent growth is going to look like? So right away, when you say I'm not going to quote an IRR and we're going to hold these things forever, like a lot of institutional investors are like, <laughs> you know, because um, uh, it's not how they see the world. Now, sure. fortunately for us, there are a bunch of families in particular who have made an enormous amount of money buying and holding Southern California real estate over the last, uh, you know, two, three generations. Um, and to them, the thought of operating on a like IRR maximization basis is crazy. If you ask them, like, are they going to sell this building that they've owned since 1955? And what's the IRR on it? They look at you like you've got three heads. Um, I mean, a lot of them are, you know, run without any debt. Sure. Um, so, uh, so, so for us, we've sort of been able to, it, it, it took a long time, although, uh, as I'm sure we'll talk about Twitter accelerated it. Um, we, uh, we have been able to find a group of investors who sort of buys into the idea that you buy good real estate in, uh, uh, in, in supply constrained markets, you renovate it or you make it good and you do a good job managing it and you lever it sort of relatively conservatively and you just own it. And over time you should do really well, how well you're going to do that's kind of unknowable. Uh, you know, and anyone who tells you that, that they do know is crazy because it, it, it's just not, that's just not the way the world works. But you know, as we were talking about earlier, like people do want to live here. It's a, it's very economically uh, dynamic. The weather's great, all that stuff. So, and we don't build enough for reasons having to do with our insane government. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a good, good place to own apartments. Are you um, able to share what your average, I guess, cash on cash or what metric do you look at? Or do you at least tell your investors what you typically average? Yeah. The, the way we think about it uh, is, uh, and this is kind of why we're not doing rehab deals right now. We want um, the unlevered yield on cost to exceed the cap rate at which you can buy um, buy a, a new building or similarly renovated building by a good 150 to 200 basis points. Sure. So what that means is if you can buy a five cap in the market, like I want to be legging into a six and a half, seven. Okay. And for a very long time, we were able to do that. And it was this wonderful situation where we would leg into a six and a half or seven, and then we would go and refinance at four and a half and pull all the money out. Mm -hmm. And so we have all these buildings where, you know, we bought the building, we did this amazing gut renovation. Uh, uh, the units are amazing. All the systems are new. It's almost like a brand new building. And we have all the cash back out to the investors and we and the investors just own it forever with no cash in it. And yep. some of those earlier buildings, we've now refinanced them two or three times and pulled more cash out tax free. It's, it's an amazing business. Um, the problem is that that breakdown, that w the numbers are currently broken, which is to say that um, given the interest rate environment we're in, like we could probably borrow at six right now. So, uh, but, but the entry prices for, for, for the crappy buildings that we would normally buy in no way reflect that interest rate. So I like, I, you know, I could whatever the, to the extent that I'm looking at rehab deals right now, when I look at them, it's like, I'm going to do a ton of work for two, two and a half years. And at the end, I'm going to have a 5.5 unlevered yield on cost. And it's just like, life's too short. Like, there's yeah, no, it doesn't there's make sense. sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So how are you spending your days? <laughs> if you're not transacting. But before yeah. you get to that, just curious, is your loan profile, I mean, most of my apartment clients use Fannie Freddie, but are your buildings big enough to do Fannie Freddie or are you doing bank loans? Um, we have, we do have some Fannie Freddie loans. Um, in general, the, uh, for, for our product type, uh, actually banks have like, uh, and, and, and this has probably changed, <laughs> but, uh, regional banks have always, have usually been our best lender. So yeah. I'll, I'll actually, let's, um, let me take that back right now in the last, let's say six months to a year, um, we have primarily borrowed from Chase, mm -hmm. um, Prior to that, it was like PacWest and First Foundation and those kind of banks. They would beat Fannie and Freddie for our type of product. Um, and obviously, it's much easier to transact as well. Sure. Non-recourse product? Yeah, non-recourse. I mean, that's that was the business for a really long time. It was like buy a two, three million dollar building, put a couple million bucks into it to, you know, completely remake it. Uh, you know, so maybe you're all in for four, have the building valued at, 
you know, in that scenario, maybe the building gets valued at five and change, you know, 5.3 or whatever the number is. Uh, and then go get a loan for, you know, 3.8 or four or whatever the number is, non-recourse, a couple of years of IO, ideally, uh, and, and give it basically all the investors get all their money back. And then we and the investors own it. And that's just, a, that's a, that's a great recipe. And we sure. turn that crank a lot of times. Um, so that's, so, uh, as, as I said before that, unfortunately that business is currently, uh, currently broken. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, who knows if we had a crystal ball, we'll know where rates are going, but, uh, you know, one, I don't want to call it a positive, but maybe ancillary effect of the banking fallout over the last month or so may be that we will reach equilibrium in terms of the Fed and how it perceived, you know, and inflation and where interest rates are going. And so we may just be getting where we need to get to a lot faster because of the banking crisis. I look, I think that that's a possibility. Um, But what I don't see reflected in the pricing at all right now. So basically my, my objection to pricing right now, and I'm sure all the sellers are like, we don't care, (laughs) but but I'll tell you the way, the way the way that I'm thinking about it is, um, there's two, there's two sort of macro factors that I'm thinking about. One is rates and the other is employment. Okay. And what I'm saying is that pricing does not reflect rates, not taking into account what you think about employment. But as we know, the feds, like their objective in cranking the rates up is to soften employment. And obviously employment is directly related to rents. So it's like, even if you, I don't think the prices make sense based on the rates at today's rents, but I also expect that because uh, rates are higher, that we are going to see softening employment and therefore softening rents too. Sure. So it's like, it's not just a rates issue. It's, it's, it's sort of like more fundamental than that. Yeah, no, I get it. And uh, we'll see it. There's just a not, there is not a price discovery overall, uh, regardless of the market, the bid ask spreads too wide uh, sellers are still hoping for 2021 prices and buyers don't want to be foolish and feel like if I transact now, can I buy this building for five, 10, 15% less over the next several months? And so we've got this period of just, just paralysis and yeah, that's well, where we and, are. And the, look, and the, and the truth is that the opportunity caught from the, like, okay, so take is given that I like to transact. Like I'm a deal junkie too. Like I, I like doing deals, right? And I get paid when we do deals. So, um, but uh, uh, I, I can't, the investors have high opportunity cost right now. Like they can go get four and a half or whatever in T-bills. Yeah, with no risk. With no risk. And so, I mean, you know, a career in doing the kind of stuff that we do is fundamentally based on retaining the trust and respect of the capital providers. And if I bring them a deal and I'm like, Hey, we're going to bang our heads against the wall for two and a half years here. And if everything goes well, we're going to get a five or a five and a half. And they're like, I can get a four and a half in T bills today. They're going to lose trust and respect for me. So even if I want to transact, even if if I want to, I can't like, I can't bring that to the investors. They'll laugh me out of the room and rightfully so. All right. So then let's pivot the conversation to how you fill your time because you're a deal junkie, type A personality. I've known you for a couple of years now. You, you, you can't just sit, you know, and watch uh, Netflix all day. So, so tell me about other business opportunities that you're involved in. Yeah. So I've got a lot of stuff going on right now uh, to fill my time and uh, I'm, ex- I'm excited about all of it. So the first thing to say is we continue to grow our management business. Um, and uh, we, we, we bootstrapped this thing from 40 units to 1,000, like painfully over years. And um, one of the things that meant is that we had, we, we probably had some legacy systems and didn't have the right talent in place. And over the last year or so, we've really transformed that business. Uh, it's, it's much more professional. We're doing a really good job. Uh, and I think we've been rewarded by, by, by getting a lot of new clients. So we're happy to do that business. I mean, obviously it's not the same as owning, it's a different business than owning the real estate, uh, but it's a business we're happy to be in. We will be in forever. Um, I'm hoping one of my kids will want to run it and we're just, you know, but it's the kind of business that, um, you don't want to grow a property management business too fast. Like it's, it's a people business. So if you, if you try to grow it at 50% a year, and we did this for a while, everything breaks. 
you, you run out of people, you, 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 your systems break. Um, so you want to, you want to grow it, but you want to grow it like in a sustainable way, like, you know, whatever it is, 10, 15% a year and 10, 15% a year compounded annually over a career ends up being a lot of growth. So we're, um, so we're doing that and I'm excited about it and uh, I'm very, very happy about how that business is going now. The next thing is, as you alluded to before, I've built a very large following on real estate Twitter. And that has led to a number of opportunities. The first one of which is this, let's call it an unconference, an event that I've been running for the last couple of years uh, here in LA, where we bring together about 300 independent deal sponsors and um, passive allocators who want to meet them. And it's this year, it's uh, late September in Santa Monica. Um, and it's great. It's like it's like a bunch of deal junkies and in all kinds of different interesting niches, stuff I would never have considered, you know, like people buying rural self-storage and people buying and or building uh, uh, really interesting short like uh, mini mansions, short term rental mansions. They're almost like they're like imagine a boutique hotel, but only one like with one room, but huge that rents for, you know, $8,000 a night, like just like crazy businesses like that. And many of them earn really interesting returns because they're, you know, they're doing, they're either sub-institutional scale or just not institutional at all. And so there's all these interesting cowboys out there, cowgirls out there doing, and it's cool to bring that group together and learn from each other and meet each other. And obviously allocators come and want to meet those kind of people to put, to, uh, put money into their deals. Um, so we've been doing that, uh, and that's a, a nice business for us. My wife runs it with me. Uh, and then I'm trying to get you to come this year. We all go to a lot of conferences. You could be a professional conference goer. What is it about this conference? You even called it the unconference. So what is different about reconvene? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, obviously I've go to a lot of real estate conferences, although not as many as I used to. Um, and Same. I mean, I, I like, I can't stand it to be honest. Like it's whatever <laughs> in suits bunch of like business cards and a bunch of like small talk and you talk to someone for five minutes and you never talk to them again. And it's just like right. a ah, like disaster from my perspective. Um, reconvene is like uh, two and a half days. Um, you're with a relatively small group of people. We limit it to 300 people. Um, we, uh, we put everyone in a whole bunch of different contexts. So there are a few talks in the main stage, but there's also breakout dinners, um, you know, small groups, hand curated, like um, 10 person dinners where we put together a group of people who are interested in the same asset class and geography. Um, same thing with small group lunches where we put four people together and send them out to lunch. Um, we have hikes. We have uh, this year, we're going to do these really interesting breakout sessions where we're bringing in experts to talk about um, things like, you um, uh, the, the impact of AI on real estate, like bringing sure. in some seriously interesting people who are on the cutting edge of that to talk to all of us about what this is going to mean for our businesses. So it's, and then, and then on, on top of all that, it's like really good food and booze. And so the idea is that instead of having a bunch of stupid five minute conversations with someone who's going to give you your business card and you're never going to talk to them ever again, um, it's, you're talking to, first of all, real operators who are like doing interesting stuff or allocators who are trying to find operators. And you're doing it in a kind of a series of different contexts and uh, over two and a half days, that's enough time to talk to someone two, three, four times. And, and, and really that's actually how you start to build a real relationship. And we've had tons of deals come out of it. Uh, people working together on the operator side, a lot of people who got funded as a result of meeting allocators there. Um, and it's not just about capital it's there are all kinds of things that i've learned from these people both at twitter and at the event like i mean we now employ a bunch of people in the philippines and that was really it's been really good for our business and it's something that would without this like community i would never have known that that was even a possibility and now it's an that those people are an integral part of uh, of our business so it's it's really learning from other operators at least as much as it is finding stuff to do together and what what made you even think of putting on a conference? So real estate Twitter is a really special community. Um, it's, it really took off in earnest, like right around the time of the pandemic, cause everyone was like at home with nothing to do. 
And um, it brings together, as I said, people in every asset class, different geographies from all over the world, uh, mostly, mostly the United States, but like tons of Europe and Canada and stuff too, some Mexico. Um, and so that community, it's, it's, it's been fascinating. And people, I think because we're mostly not in each other's markets, we're not, mo it's not really competitors. Um, people are, are, feel very open about sharing and being helpful. And so it's got this, it's a community that's got this really wonderful feel to it. And uh, people are teaching and learning. And then there's a lot of people who don't really say anything, but they're trying to allocate capital. So, I mean, we got a check for 20 million bucks from a guy I met on there. We've raised God wow. knows much more from people we've met in, in, in you know, in smaller chunks. Um, so, uh, so it's been, I mean, it's been enormously valuable to my career. And uh, for whatever reason, I've sort of found myself at the center of it. Um, there's no, like, it's, there's no hierarchy. There's no, you know, no one gets a, a hat or a badge or whatever. But um, your but grand, I, mar your grandmaster I, I exactly, of real right. estate Twitter. Exactly. Exactly. I have a little scepter that I carry around. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so anyway, so like, uh, I guess it's like two and a half, three years ago, I basically put a tweet out and was like, Hey, would everyone like to come to LA? And there was a lot of interest. And then I said, okay, well, let me put up a one page website and take hundred dollar deposits. And I tweeted and I was like, Hey, if you want to come, I've like, here are the dates. I have no idea what it's going to be yet, but if you want to just come and hang out, uh, put down a hundred dollar deposit and that'll reserve your ticket. And I think like 350 people, put down a hundred dollar deposit. It was like, okay, like, guess I better plan this thing. Uh, and the first one uh, was in Hollywood, which, you know, it went pretty well, but like Hollywood at that time was a little bit messy. We yeah. went to Santa Monica last year. It was a really big success. And, uh, and, you know, so we're, we're doing it in Santa Monica again, uh, which uh, let's see, September 27th through the 29th of this year. And again, uh, just I'm gonna. I'm now. I'm gonna uh, uh, be self promotional. It's called Reconvene, and you can go to it's re convene.com. You can read. Yeah, I was gonna it. ask you. So it would be great. Uh, I'd love to. I've heard great things. Uh, I, I'm. I'm definitely not as active of a user of Twitter as you. I follow, and uh, I, I see you talk about it. I see others talk about it, and I know we know a, a bunch of people in common uh, who have attended. Uh, um, and so, so I'd love to, to make it out. Um, so, all right, lastly, I know you and I were, were talking about an, one other aspect of, of your business and that's on, 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 the capital side. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit more about how your, uh, what your involvement is and how you're helping sort of emerging sponsors, managers, uh, with capital. Yeah. So, uh, one of the frustrations of our business has been that, I mean, it's, it's fundamentally quite a, like a, a small niche, like, you know, $220 million over 10 years. Like we're, we're, we're tiny, right? Like we're not, um, we're just like, it's a very, very tiny operation, but we've learned a ton about how to do this, like how to add value to apartment buildings. Um, and so a guy who I know who uh, named Rhett Bennett, who has a more, a much more of an allocation background, like has worked allocating very, very large amounts of capital. He was having the problem that, well, he came to me at one point and was like, hey, can you take 50 million bucks? And I was like, that'd be awesome, but we have nowhere to put it. <laughs> like, there just aren't enough deals. There's not, our strategy is capacity constraint. So then we started thinking about it, Red started thinking about it, and he came back to me and he was like, well, what if we do kind of a Y Combinator for real estate, where we go find a bunch of really ambitious young people who want to build their own businesses in different markets across the United States. And we'll start with multifamily, but like eventually it can be storage or industrial or whatever too. Um, and we will help them get in business uh, by teaching them and providing them some operating capital and taking a very small slice of their GP business. And then we will um, ourselves build a large asset management business by supplying them with LP capital. And, uh, and so that's what we're doing. So we, we launched it, um, last week, we got 1500 indications of interest from operators interested in working with us, uh, hundreds and hundreds of investors interested in, in helping to capitalize those emerging managers. This is the amazing, that, this is what having large distribution on Twitter does. It's, it was just, it was amazing. My, the people, I'm, I'm, so we, we raised a bunch of money for this and we, so we have a team and everything. And, and one of the team members, 
like reaches out to Rhett uh, Tuesday, like an hour after I had posted the original tweet was like, I think we're under attack by, by hackers. <laughs> <laughs> because it was like, like all these people like wanting. Amazing. To so there really seems to be uh, a lot of people who are, and, and, it, and the quality of these people who are applying, it's just astounding. It's like, we, we have people who, who are like vice presidents at real estate private equity shops that you know of, that you like, mm -hmm. you know, everyone knows, uh, you know, who, who are like five and 10 years into their careers in real estate private equity, who for whatever reason have not gone out on their own. And we're giving them the opportunity to do that. And people who've had a brokerage background, um, so people who have been sort of like more on the architecture slash construction side of things. So we're going to start putting five or 10 of these people into business every six months. And over time, hope to um, hope to be able to put out a lot of LP capital and build a very large asset management business. Oh, I, I love it. I mean, it's uh, something that I'm, I help out with, uh, you know, I want to say younger, not necessarily younger, but just those that haven't gone out on their own, uh, who, who have an entrepreneurial bug, uh, but, you know, maybe they have an institutional job uh, and hooking them up with capital is, is just lightning, you know, l lighting it's fuel for them, right. Uh, for, for them, for them to be able to, to transact as, as we all know, there's three components to this business, right? There's finding deals, there's executing on your business plan and finding capital and all, all three of those have to work. And so uh, the fact that you're able to, to provide capital and also be part of the GP and then allocate and find LP, it's, uh, it's tremendous. So what would you say is the average, um, I don't know, the average check size, both on the GP and the LP uh, that these emerging managers are uh, seeking? So these, so it's, first of all, it's early days, um, but uh, we, we are we're going to be focused at least initially on the sub institutional end of the market. So we think that these people are going to be buying, like let's call it twenty million and under deals, in part because obviously that that the market for those deals is much less efficient than the than the uh, the market for larger things. You know, if they turn out to be good and they turn out to be able to source for larger deals, we're happy to help them do larger deals too. Um, so that's so so, but I think another thing to say about this particular business is one of Rhett's insights, which I thought was when he came to me with it, I thought was pretty profound, is the following. In the same way that our business model at Adaptives um, is focused on these long-term holds, the standard real estate private equity um, maximize IRR type game plan which works really well if you're a non-tax paying LP, right? If you're like a foundation or an endowment, you don't give a shit about it. You just want to, you just want to maximize the IRR and who cares about the, the, the taxes because you don't pay them. But there's a lot of investors who want to own stuff long-term. Like if you think about it again, it's like a wealthy family wants to just buy good real estate and hold it. And so the problem is that the, the kind of, a lot of GPs are serving up deals to these capital providers that are not structured in the way that the capital provider wants them to be structured. Like, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with LPs who are like, yeah, I invest in a syndication and then the GP sold it in three years. And I'm really angry about it because we had it, like, I like that real estate. It was performing well. And yeah, the guy wanted to crystallize his promote, but like now I have to pay a bunch of taxes and try to put the money out again. And so, Part of what we're doing here, it's it's not just like a, a normal co-GP business or a normal seating business. What we're doing is sort of um, training and incentivizing these, um, these young people to go out and find the kind of deals that, that long-term tax-paying LPs want to be in. Sure. And so that means like probably some supply-constrained markets, Probably we're not going to be like lipsticking 60s and 70s garden style. We're, we're going to want high quality buildings. We want to use moderate leverage. The, the economic arrangements as between us and the, and the LPs and the GP are set up so that the GP can make money from a long term hold. So, that, so that the whole thing is sort of structured to be really differentiated from like the normal real estate private equity model. And we think we're going to be able to raise very large amounts of capital from from wealthy, frankly, from wealthy tax paying families that are like, look, I would love to own a diversified portfolio of apartment buildings in good markets all over the country. 
selected by you guys, run by operators who know what they're doing and held for the long term. Makes a very sound business model and and the the uh, amount of just years of experience and just advice uh, and of helping them avoid pitfalls and the proper structuring and just it's not even proper structuring. It's just what makes sense if you just take a step back and think about it. It's not that it was improper structuring from a legal perspective. It was just it didn't make sense from the it, it was like a uh, a round peg in a square hole type of thing. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And it's and I think there's, look, there's nothing wrong with the standard, standard real estate private equity model. Like it, people have made a lot of money. People have made a lot more money than me. I mean, it's just it's just that we think that there is a bunch of demand among investors for like a different way of doing the business. And yeah. we've sort of proved it out to some extent with Adapt over the last ten years. Along the way, made a ton of mistakes around structuring. I mean, all, I, mean I made every mistake in the book. Um, maybe not everyone, uh, but I, but, but so the idea is to sort of help these young people build businesses that are sort of like ours, but much more quickly, uh, and, and avoiding the pitfalls that we, uh, that we encountered. I love it. Uh, let's finish up the world famous real talk lightning round set of questions. You ready for that, for this Moses? Uh, fire away. What was the one tweet that you sent out? that got, I don't know if it's the most responses or the most, uh, I don't know, controversial, just the most reactions um, to a tweet that you have sent out. Well, the, I mean, the, look, the, uh, the, the tweet about, actually, the, the, the one I'm proudest of is the tweet about Reseed, which was last week, actually. Because, okay. I, you know, so what I did is I asked people, I said, look, we're announcing this new thing. And we think it's really cool. And I appreciate it if you would retweet this um, because uh, it's important to me. And uh, the community, the real estate community on Twitter, like, I mean, it really came through for me like big time. Like they, basically 500,000 people saw that one tweet. Wow. And, and, uh, and that's what led, it led to all those uh, indications of interest from operators. It led to tons of interest from some very large uh, potential investors, you name it. And so, um, and for, so that wasn't the, obviously that's not like controversial or whatever, but, but it, that, it was amazing because I, mean, I knew that the response was going to be good, but I had no idea it was going to be that good. And I'm so thankful for it. And it's like, uh, you know, it's going to make the business. It shows the power of Twitter, the power of social media. And that's why I call you the Kim Kardashian of real estate. Twitter. <laughs> I think she's got better hair. <laughs> uh, well, your hair, you know what? You've got some good hair there, Moses. I can't pull that off, I, especially not as an attorney, but uh, I wish I had that much hair. Uh, all right. How about the best? You're giving so much advice to younger people. What's the best advice someone has given you? Oh, man. Oh, there's so many. Uh, there's so many examples of this. Um, you know, it's not so much advice. I mean, I, I, I could give you a bunch of advice I've got from other people. I and mean, one of the things I think we've been good about is I realized early on that um, I should not be arrogant. In other words, we were doing business with a lot of people who are a lot smarter and more experienced than us. And so we've learned a ton from our LPs, just a ton. But uh, the most impactful thing that anyone ever said to me was actually a guy, he's our largest, still our largest third-party management client. And we renovated probably 20 or 25 buildings for him uh, on a fee basis. And, you know, he's become an LP and a kind of a friend. And he said to us very early on, he was like, uh, you're going to be successful. And I was like, at the time, like we didn't, I mean, we were broke. We had, maybe we owned a couple buildings and we were scratching. Maybe we managed 40 units or 60 units or whatever it was. And I was like, I, there was absolutely no part of me that was like confident that we were going to succeed. I mean, I, I had kind of low opportunity costs because it was during the GFC. So I didn't like, I couldn't get another job. So I didn't really have a choice besides to keep putting one foot in front of the other. But like, it was terrifying. It was so stressful. We were like, it was just, a, it was all, I call that my, my crawling across glass period. And this guy, Jeff, who really like has been around the block a bunch of times and made a lot of money in real estate was like, you guys are going to be successful. And it, at that particular moment, it, it really meant a ton to me. And it kind of gave me, I guess, maybe like some fresh energy to keep crawling and it worked. Yeah. And what would you say is the, and we'll finish it with this question. 
you're 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 evaluating a lot of operators, emerging manager operators to put money uh, into. Uh, what's the one or two qualities that that you think are most important uh, when you're evaluating them? Yeah, it, it's two, and I go back and forth about which one is more important thing of the day. Yeah. Well, um, the first thing to say is it's got to be ambition. Like you really, for this business to work for us, these people, at least some of them need to go build very large businesses, larger than adaptive. So like we need people who are like, want to want to build multi-billion AUM real estate businesses. Not, this isn't like a lifestyle thing. This isn't, so we need some absolute killers. And, and fortunately, I think we, you know, we're, we've got applications from people who look like they, they, they are that. Um, but the other thing that we need that's at least as important is uh, integrity. And uh, the reason I say that is, I, you know, I, I think I'm, I think I, like I said, we own 50 building, 54 buildings or something. I manage 70 something buildings for other people. There are decisions that I make every day that no one will ever hear about. No one externally, any, no, no investor, no property manager will ever hear about. And over and over and over again, I am confronted with choices where I can either put myself first at the expense of the investor or the client, or I can put them first. And one of the things that we've always done is just like as painful as it's been sometimes. And I got, I mean, I once spent $40,000 of my own money repainting a client's, a, a building because we cho chose the wrong, uh, chose the wrong designer. And, and, and she convinced us to paint a building yellow. My partner and I looked at it and we were like, God damn it, this is terrible. We can't. And so we, it was like a third of our fee we spent painting the book. So in other words, we, we, we have just, we made a career out of making those choices of prioritizing other people's interests over our own. And that has paid off for us. And so yeah. we, need, we, we know how much uh, damage the wrong person can do and how and, and, and someone without integrity can do. And we know how important it is to have people with integrity. So, uh, so, that's, so that's the other thing. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And so many of my clients that have had uh, obviously issues during the GFC, it was how they handled themselves, open communication with investors, with lenders, where they are now 10 times wealthier than what they were going into the GFC. You know, I'm an employer of 60, 65 people here in my law firm. It is hard to determine whether someone has integrity or not in an interview stage. So how can you ferret that out when you are evaluating who to invest with? It's a, it's a real, it, honestly, like, you know, it, it's really hard. Um, you know, we obviously we'll do the normal background checks and references yeah. and all that stuff. I think ultimately the two like ambition and integrity in some ways are um, intertwined. And what I mean by that is um, I said earlier in the conversation that um that we depend, all businesses like mine depend on maintaining the trust of investors. Like we use other people's capital. Therefore, other people need to trust us with capital or a business stops working, right? Like that's just, that's just the way the world works for us. Um, so someone, who, and, and also these businesses can be wildly lucrative. Like go look at what Blackstone has built. Like that's what you can, like probably, you know, I'm never going to build that. Like probably none of the people we, we, uh, we see it is going to build Blackstone, but this business can be amazing at scale. I mean, it's one of the best businesses in the world at scale. Okay. So a, a in theory, or at least a, someone who, even someone who is very, very selfish, as long as they are long-term selfish, then they should act with integrity because they need to keep being able to raise capital from other people. Does that make sense? Like yeah. a, a properly, someone who is ruthlessly greedy, um, but also focused on maximizing the size of the outcome for them long-term should behave with integrity because that is the right way to maximize the outcome. I get it. Look, I get it. Whether it's an athlete or entertainer or real estate person, you, you need that. Um, I can... Completely, completely agree with that philosophy. Look, Moses, we're already, we could talk for hours. Uh, you're, you're, you're kind with your time. I really appreciate you, you coming on to Real Talk. Um, it's really just a, a breath of fresh air to talk to you. You really represent just a, a fresh outlook, not just on real estate and the apartment um, business, but just in business in general. Um, and so thank you for that. And thank you for being so open and candid with our audience. And, uh, uh, I can't wait to see you at Reconvene. 
Andrew, thank you so much. You guys have done uh, really great work for us uh, uh, on the transactions and the, and the deals that you've worked on for us. And I really, I, you know, I hope you, all your uh, uh, listeners uh, know that you guys do great work and appreciate you having me on. And I look forward to seeing you soon. All right. T take care, Moses. Thank you. Cool, man. You've been listening to Real Talk, real estate discussions with Andrew Kirsch. You can catch prior episodes at scholarkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and for sharing this show with others.